Tonight, a true assessment of what's happening with education in the capital city. And what about jobs and money? And would anybody want to move their company here? We'll get into it all. Roll it, Ed. Well, the uh, gentleman on set with me tonight is smiling like the family German shepherd after barbecue day at the house. <laughs> Knows all the stuff is going to be good. Let's talk about the economic health of our region with Adam Knapp, who is the president and CEO of the Bat Rouge Area Chamber, representing nine parishes, more than 1,500 small businesses and industry and startups. And man, yeah. I'm reading through. First of all, how are you? Doing great. Thanks for having me on the air. I'm reading through the numbers released last week by BRAC talking about how the region is doing. And I'm learning things that I did not know. We have historic lows in unemployment rates. Yeah. There are more jobs than there are people looking for jobs, which is actually a good problem. So I'll start at the beginning. Why don't more people know about that? Well, I would turn that to the to the folks here at WBRZ who can go and have that question with their newsroom. No, I think it's a, it's a, something that is exciting news for folks to be aware of, um, and I'm glad you're you're bringing this to everyone's attention. We have been making sure that we're putting this out so that anyone can find this information uh, on a monthly basis to give you a snapshot of a full picture of where we are. Everybody has been kind of keenly observant of this through the pandemic of the last two years, but. But really, uh, the, the information is incredibly good for the capital region. I had a, a manager of an industrial facility uh, grab us last week and say that he can see uh, a year from now that uh, they are going to have a kind of record amount of mm -hmm. challenges but opportunities for folks who want to work in the industrial sector, much like we saw close to a decade ago back in 2013. Yeah. Hiring was through the roof in that in industrial sector. Construction was kind of going gangbusters. Uh, and we saw a huge amount of activity and an impact of that across the capital region economy. That is the moment we are in today. Just so you know, a person who gets an associate's degree, this blew me away, uh, in, uh, as an operator for industrial plant, coming out of college mm -hmm. uh, to your associate's degree or even earning it uh, in, in their high school as an associate's degree can make 100000 a year as an 18-year-old. Wow. Just absorb that. That's the economy that we're in today. The, the same is true as kind of opportunities abound in healthcare and in medicine and nursing. So just an incredible moment for this economy. <laughs> so it's, it's fascinating because when people talk about the region here, those things don't pop up. It's right. all, I mean, obviously crime is bad here, but crime's bad everywhere right, right now around the country. But these are the kinds of things that you should tout when you're talking about an area. We're 2.1% away from a full recovery, full recovery of our economy, which is another amazing thing. So let's unpack this. To what do you con attribute this, this growth and this steadiness of our economy now? So a few things. One, we've seen a continued successful rebound in our industrial quarter. You're seeing a significant amount of investment and expansion in the industrial quarter. Last year, ExxonMobil announced a major modernization of their facility in East Baton Rouge. Uh, you've seen just chemical plants continue to add and modernize and expand to meet what has continued to be global expansion of demand. When you hear people talk about supply chain shortages, that's because there's a lot of opportunity to expand and meet uh, new global demand that's out there. Uh, that's had such significant challenges getting products to market, but there is still enormous demand for those products, which is why they're being made uh, at an increasing level. Uh, that means for a place that makes a lot of products that get sold across the world, we're in a great place for manufacturing. What we also have seen, uh, Clay, is companies like uh, Rural Sourcing locating a new technology company late last year in downtown Baton Rouge because of the availability of talent from our universities. Mm -hmm. We have over 50,000 folks that are in our higher education institutions coming out looking for opportunities, and our companies around the country want to be near that, that supply of talent, which makes us to be, you know, this great opportunity for, uh, for recovery. Uh, you see that kind of spreading out across the entire economy. Of course, if you're a small business owner and watching this, you're struggling with labor, right? right. Workforce is your biggest challenge right yeah. now, uh, which is what we all have to focus on and respond to.
You know, we're going to take a quick break here in a second and come back and talk a little bit about some of the other growing sectors. I want to talk about who's coming into the area. There is development all over the parish and in the region, but then there got to be some areas that you want us to work on as For well, sure. some things that we should be improving. And I know that BRAC is really leaning in on public ed here. And so there's a lot to talk about with Adam Knapp. Yep. We are talking about the region, what's happening in this nine parish area. And then later on, K through 12 education. Man, we have some atomic disruptors in the building <laughs> and an announcement about next week's show back in just a moment. Still talking with Adam Knapp about the economic status of the region, and we went to break talking about jobs and the workforce shortage people are having. Now, BRAC has set up a website that assists uh, in that, right? Tell us yeah. about that. Yep. Yeah. So we, we're jealous types. We love that some of our <laughs> peer metros have some really great job portals for folks to find jobs in their region, uh, and we've long wanted something similar. Uh, during the pandemic, our team did this great project to build a list, a list of links of open uh, positions that are open in the region, but it was really like Yahoo in 1995. It needed work, right? So this new tool is really kind of amazing. Uh, so you can go to brworks.org, brworks.org, and find uh, every job that's open and available in the capital region. Every day it's updated. It's got about 28,000 open positions, in fact, on our, on our website. Uh, you can find links to it. It also does a lot of the analysis of what are the kinds of positions that op are open. But if you're watching this and you're looking for a job, what's really amazing about it is you can upload your resume, scan it in with your phone or whatever, put it into the site, and it kind of matches up for you the jobs that are among those 28,000 jobs that best match the skills that you have. You can also fill out a very short assessment, and it'll help kind of modify it to help you find your dream position. The goal for this, of course, is to help folks get back to work. Uh, and if they're looking to change uh, trajectory, this gives them a means to do so. It's really right. an intelligent platform. We're excited for where it can go. It also, like double, uh, double opportunity here, has a way that it'll guide you to additional training opportunities. It'll look at your skills and say, hey, you potentially could also get this additional training 
that you might you know, want to go get to make yourself even more competitive for some of the jobs that are just around the corner from your current skill set. So it's really something for folks to go explore and learn more about. You know, we, we talked about it a second ago coming into here that unemployment is around 3.2 percent and it's the lowest in the history of the region. So you have all these jobs and not enough people to fill them. So what do you do? So a lot of this is about first making sure that those who are, are seeking a job have the easiest path to finding what those open opportunities are mm -hmm. and trying to it's going to scour every opportunity that's a match. You know, if you get on Indeed or something, you can sometimes struggle to figure out what's the right best fit. Right. This is hopefully one that's just regional uh, for the jobs that are here and looking here uh, and that match your skills. So the first thing is those 13,000 folks that are looking for a job have a way to find it. The other thing is we hope that more folks might be encouraged to re-enter the workforce. Mm -hmm. That number that, that is that mismatch between the number of jobs and the number of f folks looking for jobs is partly because there are a lot of folks that have just said, hey, I want to want to sit on the sidelines. Either I've taken early retirement, uh, maybe I'm just looking for a side project, mm -hmm. uh, or I just, I'm, not, I'm not comfortable getting into the workforce yet for any reason. This may help them at least start to dabble in that opportunity to look, and that's what we want this site to help them with. What regions are looking, what industries are looking at us as a possible new landing spot. So we're seeing continued excitement around, uh, I would say, logistics, what we saw with uh, Amazon at Cortana, what we see at uh, Segan and Port Allen, that continu we continued to see opportunities for expansion for what logistics is doing to kind of meet the demand of, of consumers. Uh, second, there's an enormous amount of energy and excitement happening in our petrochemical corridor to look at what net zero carbon emissions looks like over the next 20 to 30 years. Mm -hmm. They're making investment commitments to carbon capture projects, uh, new manufacturing of, of products like blue hydrogen, which are uh, more, uh, more of a green product than you've seen in kind of traditional production. The company Air Products last year announced a $4 billion blue hydrogen facility in Ascension Parish. Uh, we had a team last week in Houston looking at more expansion opportunities in, in, in renewables and hydrogen. And look, just last week, a company called uh, Origin Materials out of California announced that they've selected Geismer uh, for what will be the world's first industrial scale I saw that. Facility. Millions. It's $750 million facility to take a, a tree, wood fiber, and convert it into that single-use plastic bottle that we, we all use when we're out kind of you know, exercising or doing yard work. Right. That water bottle, which you know, previously was just plastic made from oil, can made from, be made from a technology that's the basis of wood. And we have a lot of uh, timber in, in Southwest Louisiana, <laughs> South, uh, South Louisiana, so it's a great opportunity for one, one, one product to kind of benefit another. All this good news, man, and just learning about it. And it, it, the other thing is, because I want to get to this, what are some areas that we really should kind of bolster up right now? So what we really want to see is more folks thinking about the technology sector. We've seen enormous interest and opportunity across all types of companies. In fact, we have a conference this week called Tech Next, which is how the industrial sector is really becoming more and more a technology sector and local technology firms looking at the opportunities in that space. That's expanding rapidly, but we need to see more students from you know sixth grade up thinking about what does it look like to be interested in coding. Uh, if you're a, a, a woman or some, a minority or somebody who's not considered maybe tech as a track before, this is an incredible opportunity as well to diversify our, our sectors. Quickly, tell me, tell people where they can get information on what's going on. So everybody should go to our website, BRAC.org. Tons of information about what's happening. Uh, they can find it uh, out every month, our economic research data. Appreciate you, brother. Thanks for having me. Back, let's talk about public education and an announcement about next week's show, an exclusive conversation with someone who has not addressed a controversial issue before. It'll happen here. Back in just a moment. <laughs> That's a hell of a
All this brain power on set right now, the chief executive officer of the Alliance, the chief strategy officer here on set. I don't know if I can handle it all. How are y'all? We're doing good. Thanks for having us. Thank you for having us. So it's amazing. You teamed up to start this organization sometime last year, and it's, it's multifaceted. So for people who have not heard, tell me about the Alliance. Tell me what it is and how it's going to benefit our community. Yeah. We're almost a year old. We're super excited about that. It feels like it's gone by so quickly. Um, but we are really focused in on making sure that we have better options for public education in Baton Rouge. You know, we work really hard to ensure that we are addressing the needs of the families and students in Baton Rouge and making sure that they are centered in the decisions that our policymakers are making. We do that in a lot of different ways. We work on, you know, um, helping families to understand how to navigate the existing systems, work on, you know, making sure that we have policy issues that are, that are being moved forward that address the needs of our students and families. And then we also work on making sure that we have a bench of leaders who mm -hmm. are the, the leaders that our kids deserve in this community. You know, I called you atomic disruptors in the last segment, Liz. You, you and I have worked together on some things that you, when you were at BRAC that dealt with education and policy. And the disruptor part for me is exciting because I do think the education model could, could afford some sprucing up and some modernizing right now. What's your take on where Alliance can be valuable to parents and students first? Well, I think the big three buckets of our work are in elevating the voices of communities that aren't traditionally heard. Mm -hmm. So that's one area. I think another big bucket is that we want to empower parents with the information that they need mm -hmm. to be disruptors themselves and choose the right schools for their own kids. And then the other place is in making sure that we are engaging civic leaders. Right. We want everybody in this community to really understand what the public education ecosystem in Baton Rouge looks like so that their voices can be part of the conversation to improve school and student outcomes. What are your main goals? Our main goals are to ensure that our community educates its children in the way that they deserve. And, you know, we work on that every day and we think that education is a birthright of every child. And so yep. we, we work really hard to ensure that our community delivers on the promise of that for every kid. You know, it's so interesting. We talk a lot about crime. Adam was just here a moment ago talking about all these great things happening in the economy, but there are parts of our community that you know, they're hurting right now. And I think a lot of those factors lead to what we see with crime and the violence. And education is a big part of that, giving kids an opportunity to achieve their dreams. So I, mean, I think there is value there. Do you think we talk about it enough, the importance of the education system in the grand scheme of making communities better? I don't think that you can talk about it enough. I think education is the very most important thing that can make a com community better. It is the thing that can make a community competitive against other communities. And when you think about things like crime, education is the way to prevent what we are seeing in our community, unfortunately. Well, you were in the classroom, Adonica. You, 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 you working in, in the district. Well, working mm -hmm. in the district in school, so you were boots on the ground there seeing the kids. It always fascinates me when we get into these discussions about what happens with education and the money and everything. Conversations that involve kids almost always end up in the back part of it. Absolutely. Children don't vote. And so it, it becomes very easy to ignore their needs or deprioritize their needs for the needs of the loudest voices in the room. And we think it's very important that someone who is representing the interests of the children is in this community is reminding the leaders that, that that is who they are serving. So, you know, when you guys started, and I joked about it, it, it did scare some people, knowing how forceful and fierce you ladies both are. And what did you, because I know you had to hear it, what was your response to some of that, people being a little nervous that y'all were teaming up there? We started this organization so that we could do something different in education. We've done a pretty good job as a community of um, choosing leaders and getting them elected, but we haven't necessarily done a really great job holding them accountable for mm -hmm. outcomes. And so that's why we're here, is to hold people accountable. And if that makes people uncomfortable, I think we're comfortable with that. <laughs> we're comfortable with the uncomfortable conversations as a, as a team. So. Having known both of y'all, that's the truth. What's the grade? What grade would you give the district right now? You know, it's interesting that you would ask that question because, you know, the school performance scores give the district a C. And I think I had someone say something very important to me 
very early in my career, which is children don't experience averages. Mm. And so I could give the entire district a grade, and we do, but we have children who get an A education in Baton Rouge, and we have children who get an F education in Baton Rouge, and we have to close the gap. And I think that to give an overall grade negates the fact that there are children who are very well served by the schools in our community, sure. and there are children who are being left behind, mm. and we have to fix that. I want to lean in. How much time do I have, Ed, before break? I want to lean in on the left behind part. Uh, we got about 30 seconds. We'll come back and we'll talk about the kids being left behind. And then we've got elections this fall. Talk about how the alliance is involved in that. And in the next segment, I'll tell you who will be our exclusive guest next week here on the show. Back in just a moment. So here's a question. What is something the school district can do immediately that will have an outcome on the way our children are learning and the way that they're performing? And, and maybe that's something small, maybe that's something major. But from your perspective as people who are involved in this, I'm sure you have to have thoughts on that. What, what, what would you say? I think there are a couple of things. I think one thing would be to concentrate resources around the students who need them most. I think one of the things that we recognize is that we often talk a lot about how difficult it is to educate children who live in poverty. And for us in Baton Rouge, that's a large number of the children that we serve as a school system. But then we don't put our resources where we say our values are. Mm -hmm. And so I think we could begin to have a more student-centered funding formula for how we fund schools in this community. And I think that would dramatically improve the way that we're getting that. So it begs the obvious question. Why isn't that already the case with a budget that's nearly $700 million large? Why isn't it more student focused? I think that it's just a very political question. It's very hard in a very large system to sit down and prioritize how you're going to spend your funds. And I think that it's a conversation that our community really needs to have and that our school board needs to have. Uh, I think another thing that we could be doing is taking a much deeper look at the data that's coming out of our schools on student performance. You know, Donica said earlier that we have F schools and we have A schools, but there isn't really a conversation being had about the fact that we have F schools and we have A schools, and that there's a lot of work to do to move those F schools or to close them and replace them with better schools. You know, Dr. Narcisse has been here around a year, and a lot of the systemic things that have happened here that people have tried to change obviously predate his time here in EBR. And he's announced a number of initiatives that he hopes 
will do well here. If you had an opportunity to be in a room with him to say, hey, let me help you, and these are some things that I think you can do because it's within your capacity to accomplish, well, how would you advise him? How would you help him to be successful for our children? I would say that one thing he's doing that I really appreciate is he has a sense of urgency. He has come in and he has said, we have to move as quickly as possible to make dramatic changes for kids. And I think that that's the right instinct. I do think that there's more that we can do to support work and do things, move together as a community um, and engage the full community about what parents really want for kids um, and what um, students need for themselves and see for themselves in schools. I also think, you know, I agree wholeheartedly with uh, my friend here, Liz, but I also think that, you know, we don't have a comprehensive vision of what we're trying to accomplish as a district. And I think, you know, it's difficult to talk about things in isolation. So recognizing that, you know, all of these pieces of the puzzle fit together and being able to articulate how we're going to put all of this together to ensure that we are creating a, a vision of what it means to be well-educated in Baton Rouge for every child. Is, is really an important part of that as well. Quickly here, <clears throat> I got about, about a minute and a half. Children who are being left behind, what are, are we addressing that right now or is it lip service? No, we're not doing enough. We're not. Why? Uh-oh. Oh, uh -oh. oh <laughs> we're, man. We're, we're, Cheshire we're, grin right there. <laughs> we, <laughs> the fact is we simply don't have enough great schools in Baton Rouge. And the great schools that we do have have waiting lists. We don't have enough. We need to focus very deeply on creating more great schools. Parents will use them if we can provide them. There's so, so much more we can get into. Will y'all come back? Absolutely. Always. All right. Next week, here on set, talking with us exclusively, will be the superintendent of state police, Lamar Davis, to talk about everything happening at LSP. Can't wait for that. He'll be the guest for the entire show. Looking forward to it. Set your DVRs. And happy heavenly birthday, Miss Sadie. Think about you every day. Y'all have a great weekend.